during the week uh, in my retreat, God spoke to me to flip, to flip that he wants to talk deep to you. So, okay, the excitement after 40 days fast, excitement of having two, two services, two assemblies on Sunday. It's been very exciting for me. I love I love it. I just love to share different streams of revelation. I don't understand how to preach first part of a message in the first service and second part of it. It's not in any way derogatory for those who do that. That's their revelation. But for me, I just feel like we have two, three assemblies. We have different streams of revelation so that each assembly can enrich the other assembly and become greater. And we, come, we become greater through the multiple streams of the life of God flowing in the revelation of the word of God. So we talked about the mystery of the firstborn. The reason I'm bringing this because you need that message. It's going to be a series that will run for weeks, perhaps months. The mystery of the firstborn. And I want, you, I want to give you an assignment. Check in every family. In most cases and in almost every family, the very firstborn is under attack. At the biological level, check in every family. Check, just don't agree or disagree. Do your personal stories. I have had to do personal stories as a minister that the very first is usually under very serious attack. So the mystery of the firstborn is a mystery that is very deep, that you need to personally invest in knowledge. You see, the, the power of God doesn't change our lives. Our knowing of the power of God is what changes our life. To the extent you know, to that extent you become, and you shall know the truth. So knowledge is the currency of greatness in the kingdom, knowledge. The greatest attack of the devil, in one of the greatest ways that the devil attacked the kingdom is attack in knowledge. That's why heresies. We are in a generation of heresies, all sorts of strange doctrines. The greatest enemy of the, de of the church is not Islam, it's not the pagans, it's not the slaughtering of Christians, no. The slaughtering of Christians brought about the greatness of the church. The blood of the martyrs brought about revolution in the church. I study history of the church for several years in my stories in the seminary, both in philosophical stories and theological stories, I discovered in our stories that the greatest enemy of the church, the greatest way by which the devil attacks the church is heresy, wrong teachings. Wrong teachings. So we are in a generation that teaches Christianity and takes power from the Christians. And they call it grace doctrine, but it's not grace doctrine. It's wrong teaching about grace. Adulteration of grace. That makes grace to appear to be licensed. And a Christian irresponsible. Knowledge. I want you to personally make an investigation in as many families as you know. The firstborn is usually under strange attacks. Sometimes the most excellent in a family, in most cases, sometimes the most excellent is not the first. Not in every case. So God spoke to me during the week. So go and share with them the mystery of the firstborn and why Christians have to live intentionally. And so we shall talk about the attacks on the firstborn in the coming days. And we will not tell history and story. We will see the scripture. I will, I will get you to see things in the scripture. But in this service, the Holy Spirit said, let me flip. Say flip. So we are not going to do much of charismatic thing. We're going to double down on teaching. This is Champions Family Assembly. I want to talk to parents. If you come with a child that is below 22 years, a child that is 21 years, from the early teens, in fact, from eight years, your church is behind. From 13 to 16, we have a church for you. And from 17 to 21, we have a church for you. Last week, I left immediately after my ministration and I came back a little bit late because I went to inaugurate pastors. We inaugurated four pastors just for 
our young people from the age of 17 to 21, we have to give them four pastors to man the four, the four doors of their lives. I cried over parents in the, fam, in the Rising Stars Assembly who bring their young people, usually go to church there, last, who, bring, who brought them last week for the Rising Stars and then drove away with them. And I went there and the church was empty. I cried. Throughout the week, I couldn't rest because it's like all that we have been trying to build is like in danger. We are not doing church behind there. We are doing school. We are turning church into school. The reason why it is difficult to convert a Jehovah Witness because they don't do church, they do school. They study. The reason why it's so difficult to con con convert somebody from Islam, they don't preach, they teach. <laughs> Check those things. There are some levels of emotional radical preaching in Islam. But that's not what kills is what keeps Islam. What keeps Islam is intentional teaching that starts from the earliest age. And children cram things and they become what they cram. What used to make Catholicism such a force and a power is that there was no preaching in the Catholic Church. There was only teaching. And the danger and the problem the Catholic Church is facing right now is that teaching has been undermined. <laughs> Sorry, I used to be a Catholic priest, right? <laughs> so, you don't form the future by preaching. You form the future by teaching. Real Catholics, no matter how much they come to your church, they are Catholics, they go back. It takes somebody who has come to see a higher light and a very serious revelation to walk away from Catholicism. Why? There was something wired into them from the earliest age. It was teaching. It is called catechism. It was not preaching. So the future of Christianity is not in preaching. It's in teaching. That is why the devil attacks teaching with errors, heresies. So I beg you, if you come with a young person, a new person who comes to church, and I talk to ministers, as you are receiving people, find out the ages, so that after the, the receiving period, let them be returned to their churches. Because behind the, the most important building on this compound is not where we sit. It is behind us. Sincerely, I'm sure those who are close to me, they know. I've been crying and weeping to God for that place to be built. And I'm still crying that it should be completed because we have been given vision. And that place is classrooms. It's a school to teach our people the future. People don't become lawyers by preaching, it's by teaching. People don't become doctors by emotional expression, charismatic thing. It is brick upon brick, stone upon stone, precept upon precept, teaching that turns somebody who studied chemistry, physics, mathematics, English into a medical doctor. <laughs> So to turn somebody into the express image of God in Christ who will become the reflection of the of deity on earth and walk the earth as God will want the earth, the earth to be walked upon. That person will have to be intentionally taught. I have been privileged to be taught by the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit said we should flip and do teaching so pay attention. We, have been, we are still staying in John chapter 10. We are talking about the excessive life. But today I want to introduce to you the contradiction. The opposition and the contradiction against the excessive life. Follow me. I want to introduce something very intentional. Let's repeat what we have been doing for years. While you sit, can you just raise your right hand in humility and say, Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, my heart is open. 
drop knowledge in my spirit. Cause me to become what you drop in my spirit. In Jesus' name. Can I tell you something? I live a life that is terribly attacked. I live a life of 100% 24 hours face-to-face -face engagement with satanic world. In terrible attack. My call is not a call of gari and soup. It's not pap and, um, and beans. I'm called to raise an order of Yahweh on earth. I am a confrontation against everything that is the enemy of God. This call was revealed to me from the first day Christ came into my life. I've told you this. I started seeing demons. I started fighting them. I've lived in warfare for 33 years on a daily basis. The only secret I have, I hardly tell people to pray for me. You know it. So the day I tell you pray for me, you know it's serious, right? Even the closest minister around me, I hardly tell anybody pray for me. Therefore, the day you hear me say pray for me, take it seriously. I hardly. Why? I know God raises people, puts burden in people, even strangers. Pray for me. But God has called me to live by knowledge. So God teaches me very intentionally. And evolution in the spirit is knowledge. I've been taught. Are things I know that are difficult for me to express, but I become higher. I become greater. When you know, you rise. When you know, you increase. So knowledge makes you higher, deeper, greater. So the greatest, the attack of the devil against your mind is attack against knowledge. He does not want you to know. And one of the ways that he attacks knowledge is makes you feel you already know too much. It gives you pride. Pride is number one enemy of knowledge. You cannot know if you are proud because pride tells you you have it all and you don't need anything. So you judge everything else that you hear against what you already know and consider it inferior and the door is shut. That's why the word of God says until you become like children. Children have no history and they have no pride. They have never known anything so they want to know something. For those of you who came early enough to sit here while I came with my one year nine months or one year seven month old son he kept looking at this and pointing and I had to stop for, you saw it, and I had to stop with him and pointed. And made, we made history together. Every time, why? He wants to know the workings of that. It is new. So he wants to know what you tell him. You adults, you look at it only once or twice. You cannot discover anything new in it because you think you know everything. But children, they discover things new. The greatest inventors are children. Just that as they grow, we beat them out of shape and curiosity is lost. That's why the Western world will keep on feeding us. Because they, are raised, they raise their children to be curious. And we raise our children. And so we wait for them to manufacture and we consume. They raise inventors and we raise consumers. They are humble enough to know more and we are proud enough to know nothing. Rise to your feet. <laughs> Lift up your right hand. Say in the name of Jesus Christ. Father, take away the garment of pride from me. Dress me with humility. Give me the heart of a baby so that I can receive your mystery again. And Lord, cause me to become what you teach me. And Lord, let error not be taught to my spirit. Free me from error. In Jesus' name. Amen. Be seated. Sincerely, knowledge is attacked. Laziness is death before death. A lazy man dies twice. He dies early, lives long, and then dies late and is buried. <laughs> so the devil is the king of laziness. Makes you feel you don't need to work hard. So I'm going to look at you on Thursday. By the grace of God, after 40 days we've been circumcised. We had to delay so that there will be recovery. On Thursday, we are coming. This one year, from now till after the 40 days fast, the intention is to raise prophetic grace in the house. Just guys came with three dimensions of life. The kingly life, the priestly life, and the prophetic life. For you to truly be a Christian, 
you must walk in the kingly, in the prophetic, and the priestly. So we break our year into three years calendar. Last week, last month, last year, we tried to deal with the kingly grace. We've not really, really settled. But this year, we'll be very intentional about the prophetic. The, what will happen is that as you hear about the mystery of the prophetic, the grace of the prophet will come upon you. And the plan of God is that all of them shall prophesy. Oh. Oh. So, mark your calendar every Thursday will cost you investment. Knowledge is not cheap. It is costly. So when we hear that, ASU and lecturers in the university in Nigeria, they are owed one year salary and we have politicians who keep millions and billions and some of them we don't know whether they have authentic credential, then Nigeria does not exist. When those who carry knowledge are treated as drug pushers and thousands live in gold. That's the upside down dimension of Nigeria. And we have to change it. It's a shame that lecturers are owed even one day. Talk less of months. Let's not go there. But that's the spirit that is at work in many of your minds. You think knowledge is not... I've told you I'm standing here not the man who used to be a Catholic priest. I'm told you an, ev an evolved person. Knowledge has brought me forth. I have engaged God by revelation. I have become something else. The devil knows I'm saying the truth. If you know anything about life, you will know I'm saying the truth. Knowledge raises you. So when you say you shall know the truth, when you are in a level to be set free to go into a higher level, you need to know something that is greater than where you are. So for those of you pay, who pay money for your children to be promoted, you pay money for your children to be crippled for life and to be useless. No child should move from one class to another until he deserves to move. John chapter 10, verse 7 to 10. Before that, I want to hold you accountable. Rise to your feet, say, I embrace knowledge. Don't think I am insulting you. If you like, you can sit. And I'm not looking at you. My eyes are closed. But if you can rise, raise your right hand and say, I embrace knowledge. I pay the price to know. And I become what I know. Ask God again, Lord, don't let error come into my spirit. Father, in the name of Jesus, shed the spirit of truth as light over this assembly. Raise men and women of rank. Raise the supernatural in Jesus' name. Be seated. Knowledge is powerful. I think I should begin today with testimony. There is a young girl that gave me testimony last week, and I've been sharing this testimony. I shared it in the school of yes, school of the Holy Spirit yesterday. I shared it in the partners meeting on the first, and I think I should share it. I saw her this morning while I was praying. She's it's a very cute, beautiful girl. One thing that draws my attention to her is among the young people that God is raising here is that every night during weekends as I come here to, to, to wait and stay with God on a retreat um, to hear directions and how to go and what to do, what he wants to do in your life. So I come to pray at all times at this altar. Sometimes it is when the communities, different groups that have come to pray, they are done praying and you will meet her. <laughs> And she had been praying from the previous day. And about three, four, she's still running around like it. She's just beginning prayer. And I used to admire her while I pray. But every time she comes to give me testimony, just know this is someone who has touched the supernatural. I want to let you know what it means to operate in a prophetic realm, in a prophetic grace. This is a young girl. I call her CC because she's a beautiful, cute girl that every normal man or a boy who sees such a girl will just think, oh, this beautiful girl, what do you know? That's all. Because she's walking in a different realm. I don't need her to give this testimony because I, I keep and preserve her from eyes. So I will keep giving this testimony. It's not the first time she comes to tell me. Uh, but for those who already heard this, don't, don't be bored. Let me share this with people because this is the grace God is giving in this place. So she came to me and talked to me about during the 40 days fast, um, while we were engaging God, one day the Holy Spirit spoke to her and told her where to go and drop her application. 
So she's been teaching, but you know teachings are in different Greeks here and everywhere. Where you teach and receive 10,000, 7,000, 15,000 words. Like that, like that, up and down. So the Holy Spirit came and told her, okay, so you go write application, drop it in a, a place, in a school. On social day, she obeyed, went, wrote, and like dropped it on a day she was told. Another day, maybe one or two days after, the Holy Spirit told her, when do you really need, when do you need this job? And this was in January. Of course, you know, in January, schools are not recruiting teachers. It's not a season to recruit. That happens before September and into September. January, people are returning. Things are settled. But the Holy Spirit wanted to show us something that I want you to know what prophetic grace does to people. Walking in the place where you hear from God and speak in the Spirit. And speak to the Spirit. And operate in the Spirit. And the Holy Spirit came to her a few days later. I said, when do you really need this job? When do you need it? She said, um, maybe even now. <laughs> Like not committed. The Holy Spirit said, rise and engage the spirit and say the job should come now. And she is like, you know, like you don't understand. Is this not my mind? And there's like a pressure. Rise and engage. So she stood up and engaged. While she prayed, I think as she prayed, a phone rang and the school called her up. So um, are you so so and so person? Yes. Um, okay. You dropped an application, yes. Okay, so you, you come for an interview, so so they okay. So she went maybe on Monday. And they told me just two questions. Are you the one who who dropped a CV that you want to work with us? Say yes. Oh, we are happy to have you work with us. That's all. <laughs> That's all. <laughs> and now she's in a higher place, a bigger place. A greater place giving her more resources in her hand she didn't know anybody she didn't hear of any job advertisement the one that just guy said I will not leave you orphans I will come back to you came and said okay let me create a space so you say people are dying this season right it's not everybody that is dying if you die don't say me bow but make bow Mind your language. Tell somebody, mind your language. <laughs> Don't say, Yaipa, we go die, you shut up. We no go die. Say, I go die, you. <laughs> Don't involve me in your death. I'm not part of it. Glory to God. I say, Glory to God. <laughs> I just want that to do you longer truth. Use that to do you longer truth. That there is a grace in the prophetic that makes you walk in the supernatural. Hear from the supernatural. That is, that is at the level you operate, you don't need to sleep with a man and a woman to find out whether this is my wife or what. As if your God is blind, deaf, and dumb. There is a spirit in man. And it's an inspiration from the Almighty. <laughs> Glory to God. Mighty prophets are rising from this place mighty supernatural that's what i was called and that's why the devil hates what we do we don't do a cocky pap kind of thing we delve into the realm of god and uncover mysteries jesus said to them again most assuredly i said to you i am the door of the ship all who ever came before me are thieves and robbers but the ship did not hear them i am the door if anyone enters by me he will be saved and will go in and out and find pastor. The thief does not come except to steal and to, to kill and to destroy. I have come. Say that's correct. That's true for me. I have come that they may have life. And they may have it more abundantly. I told you the word perosis. Did I tell you that? Perosis. Perosis in Greek that is translated more abundantly. Perosis actually means excessive. 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 It means superfluous. You say, I came so that they may have life and have it excessively and have it at the superfluous level. Check your dictionary to know what is superfluous. Extraordinary. Perosis means extraordinary. It means beyond measures. You can be a Christian till you die and your life is not, does not exceed 
your small cup so you don't have an excessive life. You can have history of, of being born again in the hand of young Gicho. When Adeboye was just beginning. But your life is not excessive. You are not superfluous. You don't have extraordinary life. You don't have life beyond measure. It means beyond measures. Exceeding rank and needs. I love this one. Exceeding rank and needs. I just gave a testimony how people will put pressure on me. Go and rest. And you rest for about 17, 18 days in a five-star hotel. And children saying, give out the house. We don't need to come back. Let's just stay here. Enough room for them to play. Teachers coming to teach them. Just having, just having beautiful, beautiful, beautiful time. You walk away. You don't know how much it costs. And you didn't give one cover. And you didn't even ask people to give this to you. It was imposed upon you as punishment. It means it's beyond your needs. Absolutely. It's beyond your needs. It's superfluous. You could do without it. That's what Jesus had in mind. That's just a very carnal, minute level of, of talking about it. But it is in the realm of God beyond imagination. The scripture said, eyes have not seen, ears have not heard. Nor has it been revealed to the mind of man what God has in stock for those who love him. So perosis means exceeding rank and needs above what is necessary. I pray in the name of Jesus that before you die, you will walk into a life that is above what is necessary. Rise, let me prophesy. I don't care whether you accept it as prophecy or accept it as a burden, but I speak anyway because I was sent. You didn't pray for me to come. God had in mind and sent me and God aligned your steps to meet me on this altar. So I speak like I don't care whether you believe it or not. I speak because I am on duty unto the one who sits on the throne who depends on his power upon my life to change the course of life that you before you sleep, in death, you will walk into a life that is beyond necessary in the name of Jesus. That you will be delivered from needs. Living the life of needs. Walking for needs. To meet needs. Studying to meet needs. That you are bound and condemned to satisfy needs. I speak by the horn the oil of grace in the prophetic that makes me represent God in the affairs of men in speaking that grace will happen to you and you will live beyond needs in the name of Jesus and it's in measures it's in measures the more you know the more you exceed it's in measures it's in measures be seated. Let me scare you with the contradiction. <laughs> Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. Before we read that scripture, for those who know my teaching, I must always go to that area. You know, as I'm talking about that Jesus brought a life beyond needs, a life that is superfluous, a life that you teach in the university and you don't teach to sell handouts. Because the evil system of Nigerian government makes lecturers criminals. That they no longer teach, they look for materials that can raise money for them. But you can be in that space and you don't look like them. When you know there is a life that Jesus brought. This life has to be tested. The scripture says you will taste and see. <laughs> that the Lord is good. So I've tested life in God and I'm seeing it. I can talk. Oh. I've been given grace to talk. I've seen, I'm seeing it little by little and I'm increasing and I will talk about it as I grow. You see, you can look at your life and your life doesn't look like it. You see, this man that is preaching, do you even know me? This Jesus service, is, is he even real in my own case? All this what I've been saying, I believe in Jesus, my Lord and Savior. So what is all this? 
is because you see the reality of your life, you don't know the reality of this life he's talking about. You know what? What we are talking about is the, un, is the unseen, unheard of realm of mystery. But what lives with you every day is your human reality. Now, let me show you this human reality in Genesis chapter 2 so that we navigate how you move from this reality into living in that reality that is showing you. Because Jesus brought knowledge. He brought revelation. And you must receive that revelation, live by that revelation in order to rise beyond the reality of human situation. Genesis chapter 2 is going to give you two realities. Verse 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. Every man that walks the earth is primarily, first of all, dust. That's the first reality. That's the one that makes you feel this teaching is not for you. And I will let you see better. This is the, the confusion of the human situation. That it begins with dust. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. And look at the second reality. And breathed into his nostrils the breath. Not the breath of, the breath of dust. But the breath of what? Come on, read it. The breath of what? Consequently, man became what? So what Jesus brought back is this second reality. Because this is what was lost in the garden. He brought back the breath. He said, do not leave Jerusalem until you are clothed from the power from above. Because he was talking to dust. <laughs> he was talking to dust. In the coming days, you will understand what I'm talking about. Even from today. Let me help you to understand what dust means. And we begin to see how we apply it to you. So that you will understand why you doubt whether the life that Jesus is talking about, this excessive life, this superfluous life, this extraordinary life, this beyond measures life, this exceeding rank and needs life, this above what is necessary life, why you think does not, it does not apply to you? Why you think it's just a biblical thing? Why you think it is not true? Why you think it, it's a lie of the preacher? It's because of this dust thing. Say dust. The word dust is from Hebrew word afar. Afar is A-P-H-A-R. Afar. Write it down. Follow me. Let's go to school. The word dust. When you read the Bible as translated in English, you meet words. But the Bible was not written in English. So no version of the Bible that you read in English can give you complete insight into the things that the Bible is talking about. So, the power of exegesis is going into the words in the original, breaking them apart and pulling out revelation from those words so that you can understand what English is saying. Because these words were not written in English. And every time one language is translated to another, the originality is lost in measures. Translate anything from Ibibio into English, there is a distance. Translate oral into English, there is a distance. <laughs> That's why it's more than saying my Bible says. You don't even know what your Bible says. You need to study. You need to ask God for things, for revelation. So I love studying words. The word afar means dry earth. Dry earth. I wish somebody could run out there. This Yesterday it rained and it was so beautiful and refreshing. But even then it's still dry there. What you go to touch there is called dry earth. And that is what the scripture translates as dust. That is afar. Dust. Afar means ashes. 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 When you have, if you have been cooking with gas. <laughs> with compress. Is it compressed or? Oh, no, not compressed word. Pressure pot. You can cook with pressure pot till you die. You don't see ashes. And I come if you are. I tell you, I'm going to say, 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 
you now. <laughs> Immunity was building tongue. That's how, that's how we grew up. If I'm getting tongue, you better go here. I saw a fear of it. I'm going to move up. I'm going to move up. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You see, you're this boy. You must drag us to your village. I want you to see in tongue ashes. Ashes. So the word, God, Lord, the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground means he formed man of ashes. Have you ever seen ashes? You know, stand in the wind or before the wind and throw ashes. So they don't land there. They, uh, no <laughs> they just fly everywhere. <laughs> ashes, they cannot, you throw them up, they don't land because they don't have weight. They don't carry weight. So the natural man carries no weight. The natural man carries no weight. So when Jesus Christ said, I came so, they, so that you may have excessive life and all you have is this tongue that you carry, you know, in some of you, you are so fine, bon tongue, so short, bon tongue, so tall, bon tongue, all these things we praise you about, tongue. the real life is unseen. And so this tongue is where you have doubt, it's where you have depression, it's where you have self-rejection, it's where you have insufficiency, insecurity, it's where you, you, you feel not worthy, not good enough, it's where you have, you have this, all the complexities of human situation that when you hear the word of God and you put the word of God side by side by what is going on in the inside of you, and you just say, Bible. Let's leave this thing is the thing of the Bible. Because of the tongue situation of your life. I don't know. Am I talking to somebody? And I'm talking to you, and you are sitting like I'm not talking to you. Who's going to your reboot? To tongue. And they get in you for you from where like we came to bury somebody. God forbid by here. Ashes. That's not enough. Dust means debris. Debris. You know, when things fall, like, you know, the house is, it has fallen apart and something maybe storm and the walls come, come caving in. And brruh, 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 brruh. So what you go, go and see debris, the brokenness and the, everything is shattered. Nothing holds together. Everything is just confused. Sometimes you wake up and look at your life, you are so confused. You're so confused. Somebody suggests marriage. You say, that's not my problem. Am I even sure I can marry? <laughs> Somebody suggests you go to school. Can I even remember anything? Your life is a debris. It's a, a heap of confusion. That's the flesh. And Jesus can say, I came so that you may have life. Not this dust. A life that is superfluous. And it's a revelation life. I pray in the name of Jesus as I speak. Your eyes will be opened. I didn't come to tell you stories. I came to impart the word into your spirit. Just because these words that I speak to you, they are spirits. And they are lifestyle. Spirits conditions the kind of life. If you, if, you, if you walk into the spirit of lie, your life becomes a lie. If you walk into the spirit of lust, you become lustful. If you walk into the spirit of deception, your life becomes a deceit. If you walk into the spirit of boldness, you come alive as boldness. So spirit brings about manifestation. You see, I, these words are spirit. That means the word is supposed to bring a particular manifestation. Can we rise and just speak in the Holy Spirit? Say, so Lord, bring me specific manifestation of the spirit of your word. Halaboshanda talabra. Come on, can you just speak? Can I feel something? Lord, you have kalabra seta. The fine world, who is speaking in the Holy Ghost? Let me hear you. The fine world in my life, and Lord, your word is settled forever. You are infinite. I don't know you all. You are the ultimate higher than my conditions. I trust. I don't trust what I know. I trust you. I don't trust what I feel. You are infinite. 
You are not my classmate. You are not like my father. You are the ultimate. I trust you. I trust you. You are intimate. You are the ultimate. I trust you. I trust you. Hey, le mo se maratato. Randa la boshi manele brala nete. Just as speaking the Holy Ghost, speak like it depends on God. I trust you. Let your life come upon the dust. Let your life come upon the human condition. Let your life be revealed. Let your life be shown. Lord, I trust you. Sir, it is not over. There is another level in God. You are infinite. No end to your world. I trust you. this. I want to enter your life. I want to enter your grace. I want to enter your realm. Say, Lord, prove to me that there is a life beyond this level. Lord, I dare to ask in spite of what I see. You are infinite. Who is praying? Who is speaking? You are the ultimate. I trust you. Hallelujah. I trust you. He called for Abasi. Hey, you can see. Hey, confusion. God is aware of your ashes. Oh! 
Sir, it's not the devil that gathered the doors for God in his many signs. All knowing. He's the one who gathered the ashes. What discourages you? What depresses you? What makes you feel you are not qualified for this life we are talking about? It's actually God that brought it together. Sir, that should take depression from you. You see, I have been trained in adversity and weakness to the point that I realize, oh, so God knows me. <laughs> he touched me. <laughs> yes, he touched me. Say, he touched me. Yes. Ah, something happened. And I know that it touched me. Listen. Listen. So, a fire that is translated dust in English means ashes, means debris. For you to have debris means something had fallen apart. It means there is an eruption of volcano. It means when a story building crumbles, so you meet debris. When rocket is launched and sings a skyscraper, so when you go there, you see debris, you see ashes, you see dust. You see, left on your own, you are a fallen thing. But the contradiction, the amazing revelation is that it's God who gathered the dust. The scripture said he made you hungry. And then he gave you food your father did not know. So that you will know. That man does not live by bread. Hello. Sir, the original configuration of the making of man was so that man will depend on God, not some days, not some ways. Every day in every way. Why? Left alone. If God is not there, what is available is debris. Ashes. Brokenness. Disgrace. So sometimes when you look at the life, the disgrace that characterizes your life, the insufficiency and the never good enough kind of stuff, and you now hear Jesus Christ brought life, that you may live to the full. And a preacher comes to tell you it's excessive beyond it. Leave that thing, it's not for our own family. This Bible does not, did not think about us. God molded the dust. But he did something. He breathed. Sir, it means death. This one, you will not like it. A fire that is translated as dust means death. Death means what is dirty. Filthy. Death. Life in itself at the human level is death. That is why you hear sometimes the most powerful of celebrities, they go to jail. Sometimes the greatest pastors, they are immersed in useless scandals. In this city last year or so, a pastor, one of those who championed grace, killed himself because he wouldn't face his death. That means he was not sincere in what he was still teaching others. His eyes were not on the breath. His eyes had all the time been on the dead. And he couldn't face it. This is what makes this world not real. So all the time you have been reading this scripture, it came so that you may have life and have it to the full. So this thing doesn't make sense. I have confessed it. I preach it. I talk it. But I know it's, it's not true. So I'm not done. Afar also means rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> wow, what a life. That means God brought rubbish together, molded rubbish, 
formed man out of rubbish. Sir, do you know what is rubbish? Go and find out now. If you don't know. And then God breathed. But let me tell you something. We are winding down. We are done. So that you can go and think about this and pray about it. Your dust, your rubbish, your debt, your debris, your ashes, your dry earth, your shame, your insufficiency, your depression, your lack of self-control, your insecurity, your um, self-judgment and condemnation on account of who you are, your sense of failure, your paranoia, like you fear even those who come to help you because you feel they are coming to judge you and condemn you. You, you are excluding yourself from the economy of the fullness of life because your own condition is different. All of this your rubbish. They form just one thing. Raw material in the hand of the one who formed you out of them. God told Jeremiah, before I formed you in the womb, shut up, I knew you. So you cannot now stand up and tell me I am a boy. I am little. I cannot speak. So shut up. I know what is inside of you. I know the dust of you. I know the ashes of you. I know the rubbish of you. I know the nonsense of you. But I also know what I have put inside of you. That if you lean on what I have put inside of you, your rubbish will not bring you down. Your emptiness will be an opportunity for my greatness to be revealed. Your dust is God's raw material. So if you listen to the stories of the Bible from Abraham to Christ to Paul to Peter to me and to you everyone that God has used to change stories they first started as dust rubbish useless hopeless. We will talk about Moses in days to come. Moses say, I'm not good enough. I stammer. I don't know how to talk. In matters of David, they say David is too young to be here. He's not trained. He's not educated. The brother, when he showed up to kill Goliath, his brother said, I made your unkong in him for so in for so in him for you are arrogant boy it's not supply you brought you little insignificant dust sometimes in this dust race if, if you don't condemn yourself even people condemn you because people know you which is why so sometimes people they took fin, took fin to do. You don't believe in yourself because they see all the doors and they communicate. Sometimes your parents, all they do, your elders, your environment, bullies in school, and the people in the neighborhood who were stronger, they projected into you, and all you know is dust. So even when you come to Christ, you don't know the fullness of life. You cannot see it. You cannot hear it. You know only yourself, your dead self, your death, your defilement, your abuse, the story of your rejection. You fail there, you fail there, you try there. So you don't give a chance for this life. That's the problem we have. Let's end this. There is a key. Tell somebody there is a key. I have another 10 minutes, I will be done. But before, take one minute, rise to your feet. Say, Father, show me spiritually the working of the key. Just rise. Father, please. I don't want to hear at this point from a man. Show me the working of the key. Show me the key. Show me the key how to move from the dust that is my human reality to the exceeding life that is available. You are not opening your mouth and you are not speaking. Say, Lord, give me the key. In the name of Jesus Christ. Be seated. Can I tell you something? All that the devil does day and night is to project this dust in you. To remind you you are not good enough. 
remind you you are too immoral, too defiled, you are too frail and weak, you are too confused, too insufficient. The devil does nothing, he just speaks to you. He speaks to you, you don't belong, he speaks to you. He speaks to you, you don't look like it, he speaks to you. He speaks to you, can't you even remember how old you are? All your mates, is this how they look like? It speaks to you. The story of your failure, it tells you when you were 10, you failed. 12, you failed. 15, you failed. 18, you failed. 22, you failed. 30, you failed. 35, you failed. Just reminds you of your failure. You made mistake in that relationship. You tem attempted that one. You get out. And so when Jesus Christ said, I came, you don't give him a chance because the thief has already stolen. The thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And he uses the debris, he uses the ashes, he uses the story of the rubbish. He tempts you in the rubbish, he makes you talk rubbish in the rubbish, and judge yourself in the rubbish, condemn yourself in the rubbish. I am a miracle that I survived everything I've been through and I'm standing here. I am a miracle. I've not been in a place that anybody believed in me. Absolutely, I can talk about it and I, I would be so surprised if anybody can contradict, contradict me. The bishop that ordained me once told me, you cannot do anything, you are too weak and lazy. I've told you this before. If I send you away from the seminary, you will beg. You cannot fend for yourself. I don't hold it against him. He does not know. But I cannot forget it. And I took a decision in this life. I will never tell anybody you cannot make it. But I will tell somebody if you don't change. If you don't change. If you go the way you go. I doubt you can make it. Except you change. I will leave a room. Nobody gave me a chance. The seminary. Nobody gave me a chance. In the priesthood in those early days, nobody gave me a chance. You talk about these people, say, we have seen people like you, how they end. And somebody you walk with will wake you up in the morning and have a meeting with you to tell you. I, somebody like you 10 years ago used to talk the way you talk. This is how this person is ending now. 15 years ago, I was not there, but I heard the person, this person, that now for sure you know this person I feel, used to talk the way you are talking. I am begging you, my brother, change your course. Those who talk like you, they fail. So an authority had meeting with my brother, General Sidok, and cried, Uba, the brother is so intelligent, what about he will fail, he's still so useless, he does not want to follow direction. What is the direction? The direction of man who does not know the God who called you. And that you shall abandon what you see in Revelation and take what you see in books. And when you are stubborn enough not to take it, they say, okay, watch and see. I'm sure people are watching me. And I'm also watching. The good thing is this. I have not yet started. In case you think I have started, I'm learning. I'm doing rehearsal to start. We are going to Oron. When we come back, I will tell you we have started another level. So if this is not somebody who tells you. I cannot, I know, wait. I cannot come and tell you I've gone far. But this thing, I see it. What Jesus brought is more than the dust that I am. So I just want to let you know there is a key. You want to know the key? Okay, just one scripture and I will let you go. Just want to let you know in case you are a brother or a father or somebody who is very good at telling people, ah, I don't give you a chance, this guy, don't, just give him three minutes. A man... When we're doing interview for Goshen 2024, he's the MD of one of the radio, private radio stations in Uyo. I invited him to come and interview me in my office so that we can put it on the social media. He felt so blessed to sit with me. He was so honored. He looked at me and told me, how old are you? you know, it's like a question I should ask somebody. My wife should know this. I like asking because you know, only to be older than somebody's big credit. So uh, once I meet you on the, for this wife, I'm, so that I know how to place you with all this. Your, I know you drive a big car, but how old are you? <laughs> In case I'm older than you, I can tell you, a little boy who drives a big car. So he talks like the way I will talk. I say, I will be 55. Imagine, he said, eh, 
So you are older than me? And in his eyes, he's so old. Actually, he looks older. Emmanuel, remember him? I look at his photograph. His face looks like he's older than me by 10 years. I say, if you say I'm older than you, I'm older, but I don't think I'm older than you. <laughs> he told me something. He said, sir, I have been in meetings and everybody, everybody's telling everybody, give him time. No, you to go in the guy you fail. Tell me, sir, people are watching you. When you were in Boom Hall, they say, give him time. His government that is helping him. Let's see when government is no longer helping him. When I tell people until we finish building this, Udomi Emmanuel did not know we're building church. Somebody opened his mouth and said, eh? I said, no, we finished building this. I never told governor while we were in Boom Hall that we were building until we were done. And date was set for us to move in there. That was when I made a call. I said, we are done building. And we will leave Ibom Hall. So, so time, somebody could not believe me in, the, in my office. A high profile person in this state. See, let's just give him a little time. So we are watching him. He told me, sir, people are watching you. I say, yes, I'm also watching me. So you are not the only one watching me. I'm also watching. I'm also watching. Sir, I'm aware of my doors, but there is something I'm aware of again. That the plan of God does not end in the doors. So my dust cannot intimidate me. The history of my rubbish. Sir, so it cannot. Because I know something beyond my rubbish. He says, I have come. So that while in this rubbish called flesh, you will live a life that is beyond limits and rank. That is what I speak to you as spirit today. In the name of Jesus. See the key. Luke chapter 1 verse 26 to 38 is a long reading. I don't know whether to leave it there and just go. If you permit me, for those of you who look at your time, I know somebody is not here, but watching on social media, I say, Father, but you said service will start at 9.30. What time will it close? I didn't know what to answer. So that we would thank this maybe somewhere. Young said, now I said, Diego from for the young boy, watch us. Don't worry me about when we will close. When there are doors yet to be breathed into. <laughs> you are worried about when we will close service. You don't worry about when the doors will let us rise. When the rubbish will allow people to walk into greatness. In case you are looking at your time, look also at your doors. <laughs> now in the six months, the angel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin. See, oh, the trouble is that God is not sending angel to a woman who knows how to give birth to children. Oh. <laughs> this is how God looks for trouble. And this is how God reveals his grace and glory. That of all people that he will send an angel to meet is a virgin. Oh. When we hear the word virgin, <laughs> you just think it's normal. Let's not go into that thing. So don't you go about to win him. To a virgin be thrown to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. Now, this is another problem. The name of this virgin is what? Mary. Do you know what is the meaning of Mary? Mary is Miriam. Miriam means bitterness. It means rebellion. It means trouble. It means pain. So two things already involved. Virgin. You want to have your child... And a woman that has not yet met a man, you say, this woman is the one to bring forth your son. Okay, then tell the man to sleep with her and now say, that's not how we will do it. And now, who is this woman? Mary. Mary, remember Miriam. Miriam in Hebrew is Mary in English. And having come in, the angel said to her, rejoice, your highly favored one. Favored one who is virgin, not qualified to have children. Favored one who is Mary, Miriam, rebellion and bitterness and trouble, but you are the favored one. Depressed, you are but favored one. Insufficient, incapable, but the favored one. Why? When we talk about favored one, it's about what I want to do in your life. It's not what you can bring about in your life. The Lord is with you. That is the point. The Lord is with you. 
in your rubbish the Lord is blessed are you among women blessed are you among the dust so everyone is dust but the one who comes to the Lord that the Lord comes to is a favored dust is a favored dust, debris it means it's now raw material for glory explosion and might it means when because God has come to me my debris cannot set me back because God has come to me my dust my rubbish my nothing my nonsense sha you cannot bring me down why the Lord is with me I'm telling you now that I'm telling you you are not getting the anointing you think this excessive life will just happen like that it starts with you understanding so that you can have conversation from the point of view of God with your emptiness and uselessness and tell yourself give me some time my God is with me this, raw, this uselessness is a raw material for greatness. This is not motivation. I don't do motivation. I speak mysteries in Revelation. And I've, having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. But when she saw him, she was troubled at greeting, at this greeting, what, what it was. Why will she not be greeted? What was, why will she not be troubled? Because she knew the substance of her dust. She knew she was too young to hear this kind of thing. She was betrothed to a man, but a man considered her too young to go to bed with him. They had not yet come to that stage. Joseph was just still waiting. My father got married to my mother when my mother was still running around naked. And my mother had to, my father had to wait until my mother would come to the place of clothing and nakedness and coming to be, to understand that I'm supposed to be somebody's wife. So that is how they used to marry in the Jewish time so, sir, God does not wait for you to have everything right before he tells you I know the plans that I have for you the plans of prosperity and peace the plan not for disaster the plan not to do you harm you may be running around naked but you are betrothed you may be running around naked but you are favored and the favor is a life that is excessive so you no longer have to look at yourself and say I'm not good enough give God a chance God a chance he knows what to do he's the one who formed the doors yes he knows what you've been through he knows the story of your pain he knows your brokenness enough of it your mind should no longer be there let your mind be his mind now so the angel said to her I know you are troubled do not be afraid Mary I know what's going on in your hand, but you have found favor with God. This whole thing, I'm standing, I'm talking, sir. 30 years ago, when I answered this call and started walking, it was not me. 33 years ago, I didn't look for God. God looked for me. I have reached a point in my life, nothing can take me from God. No discouragement. No human talk. What people write on social media, people's comments, uh, people's gossips and confirm and cont whatever people see in their dreams, uh, sir, they mean nothing to me. They were not there when it came into my life. They were not there when he called me. They were not there when he spoke to me. They were not there when I called his name. They were not there in the secret place when I sought him. Sir, if you know my weakness, thank God. I have known my weakness more than you know. But there is something else that I know. I am highly favored. He's with me. Yes, I have found favor with God. And so my rubbish, a low rubbish, I'm not going to continue. Rise up to your feet. Let's, tomorrow we continue. No, on ne next Sunday. Say a low rubbish. Yes, I know. I know you are there. But I have found favor. And that favor is abundant life. Say a low my debt. A low my insufficiency. A low my emptiness. A low my carnality. A low, a low the spirit of lust. A low my laziness. A low my foolishness. A low my mistakes. A low I know. A low I'm not good enough. A low I will not do well. Yes, that is what you look at. Yes, well, that is what you are talking about. But I have found favor. The angel says I have found favor. God says I am the beloved. I am the beloved. God says I am the beloved. Can the seraph come up here? Can we tune I am the beloved? Yes. 
I have found favor. Yes, I have found grace. Yes, I have found help. It will not end in the rubbish. The story of Mary did not end in the rubbish. It did not end in virginity. It ended in the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. She said, Ah, the Lord has done mighty things for me. Holy is his name. Every generation shall call me blessed. I came to announce to you. Yes, today you are hopeless. But that is not what God says. He said, I came. Even though you are hopeless, I came so that you might have life and have it to the full. I know your marriage is not what you thought it should be. But I came so that you may have life and have it to the full. I know your life right now is far from what you thought it would be. But then I still came so that you may have life. Say, I don't have another plan for you. I have the plan of the excessive love. Raise your hand, say, Yes, I know. I know I will not fail. I know the Lord has a plan for you. I know. Say, I don't give up. Say, I will not 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 give up. Say, I surrender. Say, I surrender. Say, the Lord is not done with me yet. Say, the Lord is not done with me yet. Say, the Lord has not given up on me. Say, the Lord is not finished with me. Say, the Lord has not abandoned me. Say, the Lord still has a plan for me. Say, the Lord still has a plan for me. Say, his life for me is still excessive. Say, his life for me is still abundant. Say, his life for me is still full. His perosis is super abundant. It's extraordinary. It's extravagant. It's super flawed. Can somebody speak?
Yes, not sufficient. I am still lost. Yes, rubbish and debris, but I'm still lost. Yes, empty and ashes, but I'm still lost. complex and depressed your plan has not changed you came so that I may have superfluous life I'm tired of being delayed by my delay I'm tired of being in the prison of my shame and insecurity so I stretch out my hand and I receive this life by faith come Lord Jesus come again come like you have never come before come like the first day you came come like you came to Peter come like, come like you came to Paul come like you came to Moses come in Jesus come into this heart take away the doors I don't want to see you again I want to see this life you are the one who knows how to use doors to achieve life Take advantage of my doors. Reinvent me in your purity, in your holiness. Take some time out. Have intimate talk with God in Christ. Welcome him back. Say, I'm not running away from you. I'm running to you. 